Uzbekistan Respublikasining birinchi prezidenti Islom Karimov bu haqiqatni doimo o'z hayoti Crowds line the roads as Central Asia's Uzbekistan buried Islam Karimov, the only leader the nation has known since independence, amid pomp and high security in the splendor of his hometown, Samarkand. Tightly controlled state television interrupted hours of traditional morning music to show footage tracing the journey of Karimov's coffin from the hospital in the capital, Tashkent, to a ceremony on the Turquoise Dome World Heritage Site of the Registan Square. The country's national television described Karimov as a man who brought the country peace, progress, prosperity, stability and enlightenment. But his opponents remembered a 78-year-old leader as an authoritarian, brutal dictator, notorious for boiling alive his enemies. Karimov was pronounced dead last Friday after suffering a stroke last weekend and falling into a coma. It's believed the announcement came after evidence was uncovered and rumors began to circulate that the authorities were hiding his death. Images on state TV showed people crowding the route of his funeral cortege, flinging flowers and weeping as the coffin passed. Karimov's body was then loaded by soldiers onto an aircraft bound for Samarkand in front of his widow and youngest daughter. The historic center of Samarkand, which houses the mausoleum of the brutal 14th century warlord Tamerlane, was in lockdown with police cordoning off most of the area and stopping ordinary citizens and cars from entering. Journalists who managed to get close to the famed Registan Square saw national flags decorated with black ribbons hung up and flowers covering the roads heading to the elite cemetery where Karimov was buried. Uzbek television showed a crowd of several thousand mourners, including President Ashraf Ghani from the neighboring Afghanistan, standing amid the towering madrasas at Karimov's coffin, was borne along by men with white shirts. During his brutal quarter-century rule, which right groups say relied on torture and forced labor, Karimov earned a reputation abroad as one of the region's most savage despots who ruthlessly crushed any criticism. There are an estimated 12,000 political prisoners who are routinely snatched off the streets and beaten up, tortured and raped with clubs and bottles. Sources acknowledged that people were imprisoned solely for their political and religious beliefs and that young men can be imprisoned or disappeared solely for growing a beard or praying five times a day. Krimos' clampdown on religion was exemplified on the 11th of May 2005, when protesters held a rally in Andizan, calling for the release of 23 people held for allegedly having links with the Hizbutaria, an outlawed Islamic party. Two days later, the situation deteriorated rapidly in Uzbekistan's fourth largest city, with the demonstrators storming government buildings and taking control of the prison. The rioters then freed the detainees along with approximately 2,000 other inmates. President Karimov moved swiftly to quell the uprising. Police and army units moved in to confront the rioters and opened fire on them. By that evening, government forces were again in control of the state building. By May the 15th, with government forces still in evidence on their streets, the residents of Andizan emerged from their homes to search for family members and to bury their dead. Unrest, which has spread to Pakdabad and the border town of Karasu, was also swiftly crushed. On the 19th of May, Karasu was back in government control after some 200 troops moved into the town in the early hours of the morning, arresting Bakhtiar Rahimov, the alleged leader of the rebels. His bitaria was banned by President Karimov for the violence a charge that they denied. Estimates of numbers killed and wounded varied dramatically. On the 16th of June, the Uzbek First Deputy Prosecutor General stated that 176 people were killed and 295 injured. These figures included members of the security forces. However, human rights groups said the death toll was much higher, claiming up to 700 dead in Antizan, with a further 200 killed in Pakhtabad. Karimov's death has left a political vacuum 
but the battle to replace him appears to be a two-way contest between the Premier Shafkat Miraziev and the 56-year-old Finance Minister Rustam Azimov, seen as having the Tashkent clan's backing. As political turbulence swirled, there were denials that Azimov had been placed under house arrest to remove him from the contest. Another candidate, Cardinal Rustam Inoyatov, a 72-year-old secret police chief, was seen as instrumental in ousting Galnara Karimov, the president's favorite daughter, from her position of power. Tashkent has dismissed as false the reports that Karimov had died. The denial and the counter-denial led some to joke on social media that the doctors were too scared to tell the tyrant that he was dead. Eventually, the man who had dominated the country for all of the post-Soviet history was interred next to his mother and brother in the Shakis in the cemetery, ending once and for all his 27-year-old reign over the Central Asian nation. Now joining me to discuss this is Jamal Howard, a member of the Executive Committee for Hizbut Tahrir in Britain. His members in Uzbekistan, as mentioned in the report, have been facing years of extreme repression by Karimov's administration. Thank you, Jamal, for joining us. Uh, firstly, uh, what is Karimov's legacy? How will he be remembered? Well, Karimov came to power uh, immediately after 89 when the Soviet Union uh, dissolved. Um, and he was a strong man. He was a... Um, he was seen as a, a strong voice for maintaining a status quo post the Soviet position. Uh, and with the immediate rise of Islam, which was not something new, obviously we're talking about an area steeped in Islamic history. This is a, you know, Bukhari and Samarkand, you know, this is a, a tremendous history of Islam in this region. Uh, but with an Islamic reawakening post-1989, of which Hizb tahrir was a part of that, um, we, we saw a, a great oppression of, of Muslims from that period on, and particularly anyone speaking out politically against his regime. And what sort of um, oppression has been happening over the last Well, it, it's years? been very well timetabled. Um, Craig Murray, the former Uz Uzbek uh, British ambassador there, highlighted in his book, you know, boiling political opponents alive, uh, forced labor, um, concentration camps, um, keeping people in prison for 20 years for handing out a political leaflet. You know, this is the sort of stock and trade of this man. Uh, human rights organizations uh, around the world, you know, found him and his regime notorious. Uh, why do you think he um, sought to, uh, you know, clamp down on political dissent. Um, you know, his name is Islam yeah. Karimov. Why did he clamp down yeah, on Yeah, well, Islam? I mean, maybe by name, but the, the point is in terms of that, if you go back to the Soviet period, they also oppressed religion. They kept it very much officially um, under control. Now, there was some opening up of that in the 89 period, post-89 period. But when it was seen that there was a, such a, a widespread reawakening of the Islamic sentiments and the people wanted to reject communism, re reject socialism, reject you know, liberal values which were coming forward as well, um, that's when these uh, post-Soviet dictatorships started to clamp down. So it was really to suppress the Islamic movement and to suppress the call for an establishment of an Islamic state. You know, that, that, was, that was the key. So, so on your party now, um, I believe in 2005, as mentioned in the report in Andijan, there was a massive, you know, a lot of people say massacre. Um, what role yeah. did your organisation play in those uh, protests? Well, we've been very vocal prior to that and, of course, post that period, but I, I believe Andijan was used as a pretext for further repression of Muslims and, and greater policies were done. It was basically a stage-managed prison breakout and they blamed all sorts of people for that. But, but the bottom line is the regime used it to effectively massacre hundreds, if not thousands, of people. Um, and, and in doing that, they created a cause for them to say that, look what's happening, these, these Islamists and so on and so forth, against the regime. So it, it was a question of actually using this as a pretext for further suppression of the Islamic movement. You know, that's what we've seen since Andijan. And uh, since then, has there been any 
accountability for uh, Andijan and other crimes? So will he go to his grave, I, um, you know? Uh, yes, mind. of course, in the West, the, the, you know, people like Craig Murray and, and some human rights organizations have, have spoken out against him, you know, to little effect. I mean, John Kerry um, visited, you know, Uzbekistan post, you know, 2005. Uh, it's been business as usual, you know, the outpouring of support post the death of, of uh, Karimov. Um, Putin was there within a few days of his, of his death. Uh, again, media, you know, stressing that it would be business as usual. But, I mean, there was one point I, I would like to raise, which is that the OSCE, the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe, um, we were due, post this time, we were due to attend. In fact, we had uh, commissioned a, a, a booth in which we were going to speak out and talk to the delegates of the OSCE about what was happening in Uzbekistan generally. And when the regime heard about this, they, them and their supporters throughout the, within the OSCE put pressure, put political pressure on them to stop us from attending that meeting. Um, and again, I went as part of a delegation to Austria in, in Vienna, and we met the head of the OSCE, and we said, you know, what's happening here? This, this man boils his opponents alive, um, and you're, you're refusing us to at least even have a, a political say in one of your meetings discussing the region and discussing what's going on. And the, 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 the head of the OSC, he put his hands up and he said, I'm sorry, there's not much we can do. There was a veto passed within the OSC against us attending. So they know full well exactly what's happening in, in countries like Uzbekistan, but they are silent when it comes to, you know, the, you know, the reality of, of actually uh, criticizing the, the likes of Karamov, um, and it's, it's business as usual. So now moving on, of course, to life after yeah. Karamov. Um, mm. Do you think it will improve, uh, uh, this, in terms of the situation, will it improve for uh, Islamic groups and uh, religious political activity in the country? Um, I doubt that we'll see much change. Um, Shavkat Mirzayev, um, who was installed as a interim president um, on the 8th of September, um, he's seen as of the same, if not worse, than Karamov. Uh, another hardliner. Uh, he was responsible for agricultural policy, which again is, is widely seen as being forced labor. You've got children being forced to collect cotton. Um, and, and, uh, another nasty piece of work, basically. Uh, so I don't expect to see much different. Again, Putin was uh, very careful to stress that he would hope that Uzbekistan would continue its policies. Now, Uzbekistan's official policy is one of independence politically in the region, uh, whereas in, in reality they do have a, a relationship. U the U.S. has used the K-2 military base. Germany has had a base. Russia has had uh, military exercises and a base in the region. So I think Uzbekistan certainly has sided uh, with, with Western governments, to, depending on where their interests lie, uh, Mirzayev is seen as maybe a, a closer ally to, to Putin, uh, we'll have to see. But I do not see a particular change in terms of their anti-Islam policies. So in terms of, uh, of course, the political Islam, um, obviously with years of repression and beating down from the authorities, do you think people have the will to, uh, you know, ro mm. you know do go about uh, engaging in political activity to change the status quo? Um, do you think people uh, are just going of, to be happy? Of, of course. The, the, this is the vital issue of today, I mean, in terms of Islamic revival. We are seeing it throughout the Muslim world. Um, we have literally thousands of members uh, rotting in prisons in Uzbekistan. So in terms of the, the commitment to this cause, I, I can assure you that there is no relenting in terms of this, whether that is throughout uh, Central or Southern Asia, throughout the Middle East, Africa, North Africa, and so on, the call for Islam is actually strengthening rather than declining. So, uh, you know, the likes of Karamov will come and will go. These tyrants, you know, uh, will have their, their moment in the sunshine. But th the reality and the work continues, and, and I don't see any particular change in terms of the, the, the nonviolent political call for an establishment of a, an, an Islamic state, a caliphate, again, in that region and, and indeed throughout the Muslim world. Okay, thank you, Jamal, for joining us. Uh, it's a pleasure.
Um, but now that brings us to the end of this week's edition of Asia Wide. Join us next week where we'll be looking again at the issues facing the world's largest Muslim community. Until then, join the conversation online and share your thoughts at our new Twitter handle at Asia Wide or email us at the address below. Have a great week and see you in the next edition. Thank you.